I'm not. We should get started before Dr. Eve yeah. arrives. So I can make fun of him. Oh, Dr. Goldenberg's here. Good. Will you introduce me? Is that your Metamucil plus yogurt? <laughs> <laughs> Men's health. Men's health. Men's health. Yeah. So, uh, do, so I, do you want me to introduce no, you? No, it's not? okay. Oh, it's right. okay. <laughs> so, uh, today uh, I'm going to uh, tap into my uh, 21 year experience dealing with the Royal College. <laughs> Uh, and uh, currently in my uh, dual role as the chair of the postgraduate committee for the CUA, which is the same thing as the specialty committee for urology at the Royal College. And uh, think of today's Grand Rounds as kind of a, an update on a work in progress. Yes, check your email. <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit of a philosophical discussion. It's kind of soft. It's not talking about ligand binding domains and phosphorylation of HSP27 and signal transduction, <clears throat> but it, the language of this uh, concept is almost equally as foreign to the average urologist as science is. So here we go. Uh, and by the way, don't shoot me, I'm the messenger, uh, just like don't shoot Elton John, he's just the piano player. I'm telling you what I know and what I've been told and what I learned and what's coming down the pipe, as opposed to thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Uh, so CBME, competency-based medical education. Um, so on the left is the uh, Miller's triangle of the levels of competence of a, a physician or a surgeon that's acquired over time. First, you know how to do something, you show how to do it, and then you actually perform it and teach somebody else how to do it. Uh, unfortunately, what typically uh, our system produces is uh, shooting towards a, an acceptable performance level on an exit exam and hopefully over the next decade or two or three you improve and then you gradually decline and you get out hopefully before you cross the acceptable performance line again, Dr. Goldenberg. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so the the thrust of this CBME initiative is that perhaps we should be uh, not so arbitrarily releasing people to practice and never assessing them again, but uh, assessing their competence throughout their career path. And, and, you know, maintenance of competence is one example of that, uh, MOSERT, CPD, all uh, organizations of professional medicine have some variant of that. My preference is this uh, model, which I've shown to this group before. This is a paper from uh, U of T, Mike Jewett and company, looking at the concept of operative competence. So you've got your knowledge, which is a linear trajectory. You read and study, you learn, you, your knowledge goes up. It's pretty linear. And then there's technical competence, where you make quick gains and a, and a slope, and you learn how to tie knots, you learn how to retract. And then there's small incremental increases in your competence. You take on a new skill like robotics late in your career and uh, you can still improve but it's it's incremental now and then there's the whole ball of wax the operative competence where it's your communication skills your emotional skills your ability to position the patient uh, ask for the the stitches uh, that are coming in two steps away uh, and then control the environment that's really the whole ball of wax and we kind of argue about how long it takes to get to that operative competence particularly since our specialty is changing with uh, minimally invasive aspects uh, less surgery more active surveillance etc um, this is a timeline uh, that that I made up it's uh, not overly inclusive of graduate surgical education and if you look back here uh, Willie Mosler uh, introduced the concept of clinical sh clerkships, uh, bedside rounds uh, at Hopkins uh, towards the end of the 19th century, 1890s. The AUA was formed in 1902, which is when my mother's father was born. <laughs> uh, and then Halstead was appointed the first chief of surgery at Hopkins, and that's where that Halsteadian model of graduated clinical responsibility in hospital uh, stems from. And then Abraham Flexner uh, made his report in 1910. He was commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation to go around to medical schools in the United States and Canada, specifically uh, Toronto and McGill at that time, 
and to write a report on the quality of the education. And that became the cornerstone of basically the last century of medical education. And what he, what uh, Flexner did, he wasn't a doctor, by the way. He, Abraham Flexner owned a private medical school in Kentucky somewhere. Um, and his recommendations were uh, to reduce the number of medical schools in North America. There were too many and the quality of them was not very good. Increase the prerequisites to get in, university prerequisites. Uh, use a scientific basis for medicine. Um, give the med schools control of uh, the instruction as opposed to the hospitals. And finally, to have more government regulation of licensure. And uh, basically, what came out of that is that even today, you need uh, six to eight to even sometimes ten years of postgraduate education to get an MD. It's grounded in science. Uh, the quality is pretty uniform. There's a lot of tight regulation, and as a result, over the last century, we've been a highly respected and paid profession. And then if you look since the Flexner Report in 1910 at what's going on, uh, the Royal College was formed in 29, American College in 1913, um, CUA was just post-World War II, uh, the ACGME in 82, we came up with the CanMeds competencies in 96, then CanMeds 2000, and now we're going to go to CanMeds 2015. We'll talk about that. Uh, there's been some developments on the American side. They came up with their core competencies a few years after us. Now they're talking about work hour restriction, and here we are talking about CBME, competency-based medical education, or as the Royal College uses the tagline, uh, CBD, competence by design. I was telling Brian that I'm sure the Royal College has a department of acronyms. Everything's an acronym. And I, and I go to these meetings and I was like, what? So that's sort of the timeline of graduate medical education. So what is competence? Well, the definition is, you see it, capability, know-how, experience, expertise, proficiency, skill. Uh, that's a, a dictionary definition of competence. So what is competency-based medical education? Well, this is the official definition. Just look at that. An outcomes-based approach to the design, the implementation, assessment, and evaluation of a medical education program using an organizing framework. Are you still with me? Organizing framework of competencies. The unit of progression is mastery of specific knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and is learner-centered. Jason Frank is uh, one of the higher-ups at the Royal College. He's built his career on this, and he's a, he's a consummate speaker and politician. And I've been to the college in Ottawa multiple times as the chair of the special committee to listen to this, and every time he talks, I don't quite understand what he's saying. So I look at this, and it's like, yeah, I sort of get it. A, a simpler version is that CBME is an amalgam of theories and approaches that emphasize the outcomes of training. So you must show that you're competent to do this before you progress to the next step. Uh, so what is the outcome? It's the acquisition of a body of knowledge. It's the mastery of a set of skills, particularly in the surgical specialty. And it's a demonstration of a set of attitudes. And we're not the only ones who are looking at this sort of competency-based approach. Um, as I mentioned, the ACGME is into it, uh, the Graduate Medical Council in the UK, uh, the Scottish Doctor, it's another version of it. And of course, we came up with the CanMeds framework, which actually has been um, uh, incorporated and it's being sold to multiple countries. Netherlands bought the right to use it, for example. Uh, the Australians have adopted it. They call it the nine racks competencies, the Royal uh, Australasian College of Surgeons, they have nine competencies, but if you look, it's the same as ours, collaboration, communication, advocacy, judgment, management, etc. Uh, in the U.S., the ACGME core competencies are very similar. Uh, they use slightly different uh, terminology, but instead of medical expert, it's medical knowledge, communication skills, communicator, collaborator and manager would be systems-based practice, etc. And so we were a few years ahead of them. And, uh, you know, there's all these terminologies. A couple of weeks ago, we heard Karush talking about safety. And now we have to have safety competencies. 
and we have to be competent in the scientific basis of our specialty, and we have to be culturally competent because we have to be culturally sensitive, and we have to be emotionally competent because we have to control our emotions in the operating room and when we're angry at patients. And so I, I bought this book. It's a very scholarly uh, text of essays, really, mostly from U of T uh, professional educators, PhD types. Uh, I read it twice. Uh, it's, uh, I'll I'd like to borrow it if you're having trouble sleeping. It's, uh, it's complex, uh, but there are some nuggets of wisdom in there. And there's a lot of doublespeak in CBME. They talk about reductionism, meaning you're taking a complex set of tasks and, and knowledge and attitudes and reducing it to checklists for evaluation. That's a bad thing. Our current system it has a failure to fail. We tend to push people along. Um, granularity, reflective learning, atomization. What is the difference between expertise and mastery? Uh, sequencing learning activities as opposed to giving them all at once. I'm sure Brian's heard all of this stuff doing his master's. And then there's these, these things like behavioral observation training, performance dimension training, frame of reference training. These are all for the faculty. So frame of reference training, for example, is an intervention on a teacher to help them make their evaluations more reliable. Uh, and the literature is just peppered with this, these acronyms, which are really hard to get your head around. And so you, you, know, you go around and around, what's competency-based? Oh yeah, it's an outcomes-based uh, method of teaching, but what's the outcome, and how do you get to the outcome, and how do you assess the outcome? And my head starts to hurt. So uh, one way to think of it is that our current model is the teabag model. You've got five years, you put the teabag in, it's ready after five years, and out you go. Uh, versus you must go through certain milestones, you must demonstrate certain competencies before you progress to the next level, which might mean you do it in less time, or it might mean you do it in more time. And that, they're calling it a Flexnerian revolution. So 100 years after the Flexner report, we're changing the way we look at things. It's not time-based, it's, it's competency-based. And uh, the prototype for that was uh, U of T. They, uh, many of you have probably heard, they had a, um, a three, now they have four year experience with a orthopedic program where they streamed half their residents in this traditional time based and half in a CBME based where they went through modules and they had to be proficient at a total hip before they could do a total knee, before they could do ICU and then they compared the outcomes, some finished a bit early within four years rather than five, some finished a bit late, looking at, uh, at uh, how many evaluations were required in one group versus the other, it's way more in the CBME group. Uh, and Richard Resnick was behind that, who's now gone on to be the dean, who's the head of surgery in Toronto, he's the dean at Queen's now, and he's actually uh, done a, an end run around uh, the CBME rollout to the specialties and he wants all the programs at Queen's to be CBME first and the college has actually let that happen. So uh, stay tuned on that. So basically uh, what, what they're saying at the college is it's, it's a developmental approach. People have to go through their milestones before they get out and they're deemed competent as opposed to it's a nine-month gestation or a five-year gestation and you're done, um, which is uh, conceptually okay, but we all know that developmental biology doesn't always work. You know, there are some, some, <laughs> some problems with that. And uh, one of them is the, the logistical chaos of having residents finish early or finish late. Uh, they're not really on a rotation. They're on a learner-centered experience. I mean, how does Bill make a schedule out of that, right? I mean, there's some practicalities to the, the service aspects of clinical medicine. So we're probably going to have a hybrid of not purely uh, learn as you go and not purely time based. So this is our current model as you all know you do a basic clinical year or two we call it foundations you do some in-training exams uh, then you're uh, PGY 4 and 5 you do your exam and you're done. You do the exam near the end and you're done. The newer model that's being proposed CBD competence by design is that you have to have a portfolio at the beginning, much like we have a portfolio of our CME. You'll have an online portfolio of your experience, including an e-case log, which finally is going to be mandatory, which I, I think is a good thing. 
that'll come out of this. Uh, in your foundations of your specialty, which would be sort of PGY 2-ish now, um, you will be introduced to the specialty and then you'll go through urology and its various facets. You'll do the exam probably at the end of the fourth year and then your final year-ish will be a transition to independent practice. So you're more of a junior consultant but you're not certified to be independent yet even though you've got your exams. And so as a de-emphasis of the exam, uh, what I'm being told, another way to look at it is this. Um, so you, you come out of medical school, you're doing a year or two or three of uh, transition and foundations, then you're in the core of it, you do your exam, you're transitioning, and then you're into the CPD cycle, and then you're fading out like Dr. Goldenberg. Now the, now the real question is like, how bad is it now, right? Like is, is, the, is the program really bad? Like are we breaking bad habits here or are we breaking bad, right? I mean. It's worked since Lauren Sullivan had black hair. Why should we change it? And I know he's. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah. So that's what the college calls that lacoons. They say there are lacoons in your training where you just don't get exposed to stuff, and that's not good enough you need to show you're competent to do a varicocelectomy as opposed to just having read about it or something like that. Um, so you're right. The other thing I know is that when you're dealing with the college, it comes from the mountain, okay? It, basically, it's going to happen. Uh, and you can fight it, and you can scream and yell and gnash your teeth, but in some form, CBME is coming. Um, and so how do we get there? Well, I don't really know. But there are three <clears throat> fundamental components to CBME. There are the milestones, there are the CANMED's 2015 competencies, and there are these things called entrustable physician acts or entrustable physician activities, EPAs. That's a concept that the Dutch uh, introduced about a decade ago. So we'll just discuss that briefly. So, so the milestones are the abilities expected of a physician or a trainee physician at specific points in their development as professionals. So you have to get to a milestone before you can prove you achieved a competency. Uh, the uh, ACGME and the ABU already have a milestones project. Uh, they're a few years ahead of us, or behind us, if you're a cynic. Uh, Elspeth McDougall was an advisory to this. Problem with the American milestones project is it's very cumbersome. It's a 42-page document. You've probably seen this, eh, Peter? No? <laughs> you got out just in time. Yeah, it's a 42-page document. And here's one example of one page. So this would be what we call medical expert. The PC is patient care in their rubric. But basically, you, the milestones are levels. That doesn't mean PGY 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is a level of a milestone that you've achieved. You might achieve it early. You might achieve it late. You might not achieve it at all. And this would be specifically for uh, open surgical procedures. Okay, And so level 4 is what you're supposed to reach upon graduation. Level five is an aspirational goal, but you don't have to reach five. And so, for example, in level four, uh, plans, creates and closes wounds for routine and complex procedures, uh, blah, 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 and then they give examples. Open partial for a small polar mass, allele conduit, placement of inflatable penile prosthesis. Level five, which is the aspirational uh, milestone, an example would be a cystectomy a neobladder uh, or a radical nephrectomy with a cable thrombus. And so what our job to, is for these milestones is to map all of our current objectives into some sort of milestone format. We have to agree what's, what's a reasonable milestone to achieve uh, at the end of training. It, you know, is it a circumcision? Is it a cable thrombectomy? Or is it something in between? And there's a lot of debate about that. This is a generic Royal College uh, prototype of the milestones that's available on the web. But, for example, instead of levels, they're talking about, okay, this would be out of medical school. This would be when you're in your foundations years, you're in your core, you've done your exams, you're transitioning, and this would be advanced expertise. 
And then uh, these are generic. They don't have specific procedures yet. That's our job to populate these, these templates with. But um, it's a big task. So that's the milestone. So we have to come up with all the milestones, and then we have to uh, translate that into competencies. So the, the CAN MIDS 1996 became CAN MIDS 2000, and now it's CAN MIDS 2015. And you all remember this uh, flower. So the, the seven CAN MIDS competencies, medical expert at the core, professionalism, communicator, collaborator, manager, health advocate, and scholar. We finally got our head around that, but now it's changing. Uh, it's 2015. And it looks something like this. So they've broken out scholar into uh, critical appraisal, research, lifelong learning, and teaching. And they've broken out professional into physician health and professional. And as well, after much debate, manager is going to change to the word leader. God forbid physicians are leaders, right? It was a big deal. But in the end, uh, it's been reluctantly agreed that we are in a leadership role in the team. And we're first among equals in some ways. And so the term will no longer be manager, it will be leader. Now, just to give you an idea of the complexity of this at the college, there are 13 expert working groups that uh, to crafted CANMIS 2015, uh, which is 157 members, only seven surgeons zero urologists were involved in this. Jim Wilson had a peripheral involvement on, uh, I think, the National Advisory Committee at one time. So I'm the chair of the specialty committee, so I'm the guy that drank the Kool-Aid, right? And I'm here to sell this to you. And I'm looking at this going, woo, I don't know. Have a sip. So that's CAMEDS 2015. And then there's the EPAs, the Entrustable Physician Activities. And so what is an EPA? It's a, it's a descriptor of work, uh, a descriptor of a supervised task. Uh, it's a professional responsibility that we entrust a trainee to. Uh, and so we have to come up with a number of EPAs which we are going to uh, observe and assess in our trainees. Uh, and there are many factors that go into uh, what is an entrustment decision. There's the attributes of the trainee. So they, Skillful, trustworthy, junior, senior. There's the supervisor attribute. So how confident am I in my abilities? Um, how uh, obsessive am I? How liberal am I? It's the context of the EPA. Is it in the middle of the night and you're on the phone? Or is it next door putting up stents while you're doing something else in the urology room? And then it's the nature of it. You know, is it a cystectomy and neobladder or is it putting up stents? And all of these things go together. Um, to form sort of five levels of EPAs. So the, the learner, the resident, is observing, maybe cutting stitches, but doing not much of a case. Uh, they're doing the case, but they're being wrapped on the knuckles by the attending immediately in the room for every move they make. Uh, perhaps they're doing the case, um, but we're not uh, physically scrubbed. We're looking over their shoulder and telling them, no, don't do that or do that. Uh, we're at a distance. We're uh, in the room next door or we're in the office and they're putting up stents in the gynae room. And then finally, uh, hopefully all the trainees get here, the senior resident is scrubbed with a junior resident and taking the junior resident through the case. Uh, and this is, the, as I mentioned, a, a Dutch concept that's been floating around in the medical literature for about a decade now. So if you look at it this way, you need a whole bunch of milestones to be met to get to one competency, and you need a whole bunch of competencies to get to one EPA. You need to be able to communicate and collaborate and be a medical expert to do a case in the OR. Uh, so those are three competencies, and there's probably half a dozen milestones for each of those to get to each of those competencies. And so it all coalesces at the EPA level, uh, which leads to operative competence, hopefully, and clinical competence. I mean, a lot of what we do is cognitive. It's not technical. It's not all technical. Um, and in order to get there, fundamentally, you have to assess the trainees. And there's a, it's, the CBME is very assessment heavy. Um, and that's the problem, as I see it, for the faculty. Uh, because there are so many different forms of assessment. There's the mini-sex. Dr. Goldenberg's familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> Clinical evaluation experience, I think it is. You know, it's a checklist 
They communicate. They take a good history. Their physical exam is good. The OSATs is a is a like an OSCE for technical skills. There's the O score, which is an Ottawa based uh, score. There's the grits and the goals. There's the OR report card that Chris Guan has developed. There's simulation. You can get scores on simulation. Uh, 360 feedback from all the people you work with about your attitude, your professionalism, your communication skills. Uh, faculty don't really even know how to do this, so we need training. Um, and the assessments are much more frequent and elaborate than they are now, where basically we do a midterm evaluation, we tick down the middle of the boxes, and we do an end of uh, rotation evaluation, and then it's collated on 145 and out it goes. And even that is cumbersome. I mean, every, how many of us get emails from Fern all the time, those automated emails, you know, and you have an evaluation, and then there's the student evaluations as well. So I'm not sure how this is going to roll out. There's going to be some cynicism. And the real problem is we're in a time crunch. I mean, we're all pressed for time, right? And all, one thing we don't need is more forms to fill out, more emails. This is the good part about it, I think, that uh, all of the residents will be mandated to have an e-case log and an e-portfolio of their experience. And I'm hearing from the college that they will accept uh, any sort of version and they'll make it compatible with the college. So we can use T-Res or Toronto could use their own or uh, you could use one from the college. So they're going to be flexible about that. Uh, and the e-portfolio will look much like the uh, MoCert one does for the faculty. The residents will log on uh, and the, these EPAs will be down here. This is kind of blurry. Basically, you know, these are hematology EPAs, but you could put in, put up stents, did a TERP, took out a bladder, that sort of thing. Now, will this make us better? Uh, I can see some of the senior faculty here saying, you know, this is really just the same old wine in a brand new bottle, right? It's, it's really nothing new here. We're just repackaging it. If you look at the, the urology milestones circa 1990, when I was chief resident, this would be the milestones I went through. Uh, Dr. Sullivan started by telling you you were weak. Um, that you were skating between the blue lines, you weren't going in the corners and really digging for the dirt, and taking a few hits, or you're moving the goalposts, right? Uh, when you communicated, you were like a moth in a flame. You know, that sort of sudden burst of activity and then boom, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Marty McLaughlin, you don't know shit from Shinola. Pretty good evaluation. <laughs> you're a good surgeon, but you're a shitty assistant. <laughs> And then suddenly you were ready to launch and they tell you they trust you with your family. Uh, Jamie Wright would say I was rounding with uh, the residents while Andrew was pulling the bladder. So he, he entrusted you. That was an EPA. He didn't know it. Or he told you you were bobbing and weaving. That was like a real compliment. If you were bobbing and weaving in the OR, you were, you know, you were in the groove. That would, you had your mojo. So these were the milestones in 1990. We didn't call them milestones. We called it... Uh, Making steel in a fire, I think it was. You make steel in a furnace. <laughs> furnace. Pull, pull the you make steel <laughs> in a furnace. I'm your best friend, you just don't know it. <laughs> so, this is the Royal College train. It's coming. You can do one of two things. This is me, chair of the specialty committee. Uh, that's not going to work. Resistance is futile. So, rightly or wrongly, I volunteered urology. Uh, to be in the first cohort of specialties to go through this shift to CBME. Uh, we weren't picked. We were picked for second cohort. So last fall, ENT and medical oncology started their um, indoctrination, their uh, brainwashing, uh, and urology is going this fall. So all the specialty committee will go to Ottawa for a three-day meeting and start to map our current objectives into milestones and develop some EPAs for urology. Um, core surgery, so-called the foundations now, is going in the spring. So Keith Rourke is going to represent urology. He's the vice chair of the committee so that we don't uh, duplicate efforts. You know, what's foundations and what's core urology? Uh, so who's we? Uh, so the postgraduate training committee of the CUA equals the specialty committee of the Royal College. So it's all the program directors from west to east here. And then there's a nucleus uh, who vote and who do the detailed review of programs every six-year cycle. 
And so Keith is the vice chair. Uh, Paul Weckworth has just joined the committee. I asked him to be the region uh, three, which is uh, central Canada, basically, and um, the usual suspects from uh, eastern Canada. And so we're all going to Ottawa in October, uh, sorry, November, uh, for three days to start working on this uh, in real time. Uh, and that's, the rollout's probably going to take about two years from this fall. So let's say, let's say three years from now where we're totally adopted. So we're going to enter here this fall, uh, and then uh, it'll take about two years, and then out we go. But, you know, by the time all of the specialties in the college are done, it'll be 2022, something like that. That's the prediction. So it's, it's kind of a rollout. And it's going to be a lot of work, uh, a lot of work for the specialty committee. And a lot of pushback from the membership because a lot of people don't buy into this or they don't understand it. It's a different language. I mean, I'm pretty cynical about it myself and I drank the Kool-Aid, right? Uh, the specialty committee, one of its big jobs is to establish our objectives of training, uh, periodic program reviews, make recommendations to the college about programs and about our uh, objectives of training, not just technical objectives, but knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Uh, and it's a kind of a circular process. Uh, we revise the objectives every two or three years. We submit them to the college. The college looks at them and sends them back to us with comments and questions and edits. We revise them again and send them around. The whole cycle takes about three years. It's not exactly a timely process. Uh, but one of the most important things we've done over the years is, is to categorize technical skills according to an A and a B and a C list. A being you must be uh, competent to individually perform independently. B is you've seen it, you maybe you've done it, you'll know how to do it, but you may not be competent to do it independently when you're done. And then the C list is you know about it, but you've never seen it. So A would be a TERP, uh, B would be a cystectomy and neal bladder, and C would be a extrophy closure, as an example. And we revise this every couple of years based on technology. And once upon a time, lap nephrectomy was a C. Then it was a B, and now it's an A. Uh, open radical prostatectomy was an A. Now it's radical prostatectomy of some form is an A, because some programs don't do open radicals anymore, so they do robotic only or lap only. So it was felt, well, if you said open was a must, then a program would be found wanting when it came to accreditation. The problem with this process is that it's based on expert opinion, right? And expert opinion is the lowest level uh, in the hierarchy of evidence-based medicine. And we don't often agree. There's regional differences. There's personal opinions. You know, the, all the oncologists believe that nobody should be doing a radical prostatectomy without fellowship training. And all the pediatric urologists think nobody should do a hypospadias repair without fellowship training. And, and the truth is somewhere in between. Um, so, and, and, and our, our objectives of training have been challenged. Uh, two years ago at the CUA, the McGill Group showed an exit survey of the 2012 cohort of Canadian grads, so 30-odd grads, and they asked them, they listed all the procedures in the uh, A, B, and C and said, do you feel competent to do the following? And basically over half of them said that they didn't feel comfortable uh, doing all of those A-list procedures. At least they were deficient in at least 10 category A procedures, which we said, oh yeah, they, they will be and they should be competent to do. Uh, there was a whole bunch of them, uh, things like this, that we have currently in the A list. And so you can say, well, maybe this one shouldn't be in the A list, or maybe there's a problem with the training. And then at the same time, uh, Armin Aprikian uh, surveyed us, the faculty across the country, asking the same sort of question without telling you what's an A and a B and a C. And a lot of the, the A list procedures, at least, 50% of the respondents felt that they shouldn't be A, they should be B. Uh, anterior pelvic exam, VVF repair, intravesical fistula, these were all A-list procedures currently. And um, they felt that these should be B or C. So they asked us at the special committee, could you please change the objectives of training because they're clearly wrong. We said, well, hang on. Um, you only surveyed academics one-third of whom were oncologists who tend to be very adamant that their specialty is special uh, and it represents about 13 percent of the CUA. So the question really is are the objectives problematic or is the training problematic and we're asking about perception of competence we're not measuring it. 
We're just saying, do you think that your grads are competent at the end of it? The orthopedic surgeons, I'm embarrassed to say, are, are, are ahead of us. Um, they've actually uh, done a national survey of community orthopods and asked them to put together a core list of procedures that they feel every grad should be able to do without fellowship training in their community. And they've come up with a menu of 240 different uh, procedures which they've now distilled into their curriculum. So they're a couple of years ahead of us. So what we've done uh, in the last year, and many of you have responded to this survey, is we've surveyed all of the CUA membership, community and academic, 500 and something across the country, and, and asked them similar questions. Yes or no, Likert scale, is this a core competency uh, procedure that our grads need to be competent to do when they're graduating? And uh, Keith Rourke's done most of the heavy lifting on this, and it's going to be presented uh, in June in Ottawa at the CUA. Uh, but basically, uh, what we found is a, a menu of 30 core procedures that we agree on, but there's significant disagreement between the community and the academics. Uh, particularly these procedures where the community urologists tend to feel that these things are important to be competent to do upon graduation without further training and the academics feel no this is a this is a higher order of competency that requires further training so there's going to be some debate um, about what our core set of competencies should be uh, at the end of graduation um, so I'm going to wrap up and just say that there are some problems. Uh, there's some exciting things about it. There's some good things about it. Some of the problems we are going to face is that we're not going to agree on how to measure competence. Uh, most of us are not adequately trained to even do it. We haven't agreed yet on what our assessment tools are. It's going to be time consuming for faculty. Uh, one of the problems in assessing competence is we work in a fractured work environment where residents come to do a case at night and then you don't see them again maybe for a month because they're actually on a different rotation. Uh, you see them in clinic one day only and you don't know really if they can communicate. Um, so putting that all together as an actual portfolio is going to be tricky. And as I mentioned, the logistical challenges of, of a learner-centered approach to it getting in a cab to go downtown to do a case because you haven't proven you're competent to do a lap donor yet, even though you're working at children's, you know, this kind of thing. So we have to get our head around that. So I guess the take home message is keep calm and drink the Kool-Aid. It's coming. Questions, please. <laughs>